everyone. You're very welcome to our webinar, Land Reform in Scotland. I'm Annabelle Pigeon, and I'm Partnership and Learning Manager with South of Scotland Community Housing. We're a community-led housing enabler operating here in the South of Scotland, and we're really pleased to be putting on this event today in partnership with the Centre for CLT Innovation. This is one in a series of webinars for the International Community Land Trust Festival. So we are looking forward to celebrating the growth and diversity, of the community-led housing and community land trust movement. So thank you very much to our sponsors and partners throughout the festival. So our first presenter we have today is David Stewart from the Scottish Land Commission. And David Stewart is the Senior Policy Officer at the Scottish Land Commission since 2019. His main areas of work are around land assembly, placemaking and housing land markets. David joined the Land Commission from the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, where he led on new build affordable housing, planning reform, energy efficiency and regeneration. Before that, he worked for housing associations and for Edinburgh City Council on Housing and Regeneration. He's a board member of Rural Housing Scotland and was previously on the board of PASS, the Planning and Place Charity and a community-based housing association in Greenock. David has also served on the Academic Practice and Policy Panel to SURF, Scotland's Regeneration Forum. So I'm very excited to introduce David and welcome him to give the first presentation. Thank you, David. Thanks very much, Annabelle, and hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be taking part today, not just to share some of our work on land reform and housing, but also to hear from the other panellists and to take part in the discussion. Could you move on to the next slide, please, Rhys? Thank you. Before I really got into the presentation, I, I just wanted to have this as a backdrop or, or something to think about that, that's really just expressing what land reform is all about and why it's so important to Scotland and the people that, that live here. Um, next slide, please. So this an outline really is what I want to cover today. I want to give a relatively brief introduction to the Scottish Land Commission as we're quite a new body and say a little bit about our work today on land reform in Scotland. I'm then going to share some high level findings from our research on land for housing, how the housing land market works and some areas of market failure that our report identified. I'll then say a little bit about opportunities for community-led housing and, and some of the benefits that delivering community-led housing can, can bring before concluding with just really a short summary of opportunities on the current land reform bill that's still out to consultation in Scotland. Next slide, please. So the, the Scottish Land Commission, as I say, were relatively new. We were established by the last Land Reform Act of the Scottish Parliament in 2016, and we've been operational since 2017. We're not a huge organisation. Uh, there are six commissioners who are essentially board members and 18 members of staff. And our aim really is to create a discussion and have fresh thinking on land reform, land management, ownership and use. But we also do work to support change and better practice on the, the ground. And finally, we advise the Scottish Government on the Scottish Parliament on both legislative and policy change. Um, next slide, please. And really our work, I, I suppose it's one thing to talk about areas, but maybe more importantly, objectives. And it's really about inclusive growth and a move to a well-being economy. 
helping Scotland meet its target of net zero and also looking at how the way that land is owned, managed and used can actually help with a, a green recovery following the, the pandemic. And to maybe just give a, a couple of examples of, area, of areas of work that show the, the, the range of work we get involved in. We've been involved in producing a guidance on community wealth building. We've been involved in early work looking at the emergence of natural capital markets and considering how that should be regulated and, and how you ensure that actually investment in that benefits communities, but also Scotland's people as a whole. And finally, we carried out quite a lot of work on the reuse of vacant and derelict land, which is quite a big issue in Scotland as it's really a post-industrial economy. Next slide, please, Rhys. And really the purpose of this slide and, and the next one, please, is really to highlight that when we talk about land reform and, and our policies and ideas, it should apply both to rural Scotland, but, but also to urban Scotland. And, and it has a role in improving the lives and, and the well-being of people in both rural and urban areas. Next slide, please. So to now talk a little bit about our work on the, the housing land market and really the, the reasons for carrying out this piece of work is housing has a big impact on the country and its people. You know, ha having the housing land market function well can help meet housing need and demand. It can help ensure there's the right choice of housing to meet different needs and that's affordable to different groups of people. Housing also has a big impact on the economy. Firstly, you know, if it's affordable and there's a the right choice and people can move to work or to take up educational opportunities, but also in a lot of Western societies and Scotland certainly one, there's so much wealth tied up and housing and land that arguably prevents money from being spent on other productive uses. And the way that we deliver land for housing can also either enable rural repopulation, which is a, a policy aim for the Scottish Government, or prevent it from happening. It has an impact on our ability to mitigate climate change and promote active travel. And the places that, that we live also have an impact on our health and well-being. Um, next slide, please. So just to share some of the, the main findings of this piece of work, which involved a number of reports and quite a lot of stakeholder consultation. The main players in the, the housing market and the housing land market in Scotland are large developers or volume house builders. And we found that their model, the focus on high value greenfield sites close to cities. And that's really to reduce the risk of taking forward land for development, which is considerable, and also to maximize shareholder profit. We also found that following the 2007-8 recession, there's a, been a decline in the smaller companies who tended to build either in brownfield land or in smaller towns. And finally, we found that for most rural areas, and this probably applies to town centres too, these don't really fit the volume house builder model. So if anyone's going to build in these areas, it has to be a, another paradigm and, and a different way of development. And, and a last point, because of the way the housing land market is operating in, in Scotland, there's a lot of people whose meet, needs aren't met by the market, that's led the Scottish Government to invest significantly in a new build programme, which is a good thing, but it's perhaps arguable that 
if the land market worked better, there would be a need for such significant investment. Um, next slide, please. And really, I, I won't dwell on this long, but this is a chart from publication looking at land for rural housing. And it really just illustrates the point that for private developers, it's only high value urban areas that really provide the returns that their business model looks for. And that really means for quite large areas of Scotland, there's market failure and that there isn't actually a, a private industry building houses in these places. Next slide, please. So the next couple of slides were really just to highlight areas where there is a gap and where I think uh, community-led housing can play a role. This one is Mid-Steeple Quarter in Dumfries Town Centre, a, a great example of a project looking to deliver community-led house and other mixed uses and help to regenerate the high street. And the next slide, please. And this is Staffing and Sky, and this is an example really of rural regeneration, an area where there's been a decline in school roles and decline in population, quite a big impact with second homes. And the Community Land Trust, working with others, have developed affordable housing, a new medical facility, and a couple of commercial units that create jobs. Uh, next slide, please, Rhys. And just, this slide's really just looking at um, demonstrating the benefits of community ownership, which isn't just necessarily about the ownership itself or about housing. So a study by at Sangi et al from 2008 looked at the Isle of Gia, which was bought in a community buyout 20 years ago now, and benefits included population growth, better wealth distribution, and they also found an increase in participation and decision making. Next slide, please, Ruth. So I just wanted to conclude by highlighting the fact that land reform is an ongoing thing in, in Scotland. So there's a new land reform bill out for consultation. The consultation actually closes on the 30th of this month. So if anyone does still want to make a point and have their voices heard, then there is that opportunity. And it includes a number of measures that could provide opportunities for both community ownership and also community-led housing. In particular, there's a number of measures to regulate the market and large-scale land transfers, and that's defined as transfers of 3,000 hectares or more. It can also cover areas where it's a certain percentage of the ward in a town or city, or a certain percentage of an island. There's to be a public interest test for these large-scale land transfers. And there's also a requirement that there has to be a published management plan for transfers. So these measures could potentially see large transfers either split into lots for sale, which offers an opportunity to communities, or it could even be sold in whole to constituted community bodies. So an opportunity there, I think, for development for community uses and for new housing, whether it's due through community-led housing or indeed the creation of new crofts. And a final slide, please, Rhys. So that's really just setting out the, the timescale for the, the bill. As I say, the consultation closes later this month and the bill's to be introduced in September next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for your informative presentation. We recognise that not every country has a specific body. Um, for advising on land laws and policy. So that's an excellent kickoff to this conversation for the ongoing land reform, as you mentioned. It's always 
and ongoing process. Particularly helpful to see the upcoming opportunities through the latest consultation from your expert perspectives. Hopefully we can have a bit more group discussion what lies ahead in the Q&As. But thank you for starting us off so well. And next up, we have Lindsay Chalmers, who is the Development Manager at Community Land Scotland, where she oversees the organization's work supporting communities and raising awareness of community land ownership. Lindsay previously worked in community recycling and reuse for many years. In her spare time, Lindsay is on the committee of her local community enterprise, which owns a shop, a post office, and a self-catering business. So I'm really pleased to welcome Lindsay for our second presentation. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Annabelle. As Annabelle said, I work for the Membership Organisation for Community Landowners in Scotland. You've probably got the impression by now that land reform is a big driver for policy development generally in Scotland, and that's definitely the case for community land ownership. We have quite an unusual model in Scotland in that our members are all kind of geographically based, could be an island or a suburb in the city, and they have to have open membership to anyone living in that area. So it's a form of collective ownership where anyone living in the area is effectively part of that whole process. Next slide. There we go. So as an organisation, we were set up by some of the early community landowners in Scotland because they felt there was a need for an organisation to really be campaigning around land reform, how that could benefit communities, but also to help those organisations connect with each other a bit better. So our kind of three main functions that we were set up to do were around policy. It's a really still a really important part of what we do. And our founding members wanted us to make it easier for communities future communities to be able to get all the benefits of community ownership that they had. So a lot of our work is really focusing on making it easier for communities that might not yet own assets to be able to do that. But we also do some work as well, helping our organisations that already own land and assets to be able to develop their ideas. So some of our work uh, includes things around planning and repopulation of rural areas. So whatever our members feel is really important for them, we will try and take that learning from our membership and try and change policy uh, on their behalf. We do a lot of work around knowledge exchange. So I'll go through some of the types of assets that our members own, but they're extremely diverse in Scotland. Housing is an important part, but it's, it's not the complete picture when it comes to community ownership in Scotland. So because we can't possibly know anything in our kind of small team of six staff, a really important part of what we do is helping share that knowledge around our network so that people can kind of access help from another community that might have developed the same type of asset. We also do a lot of work around awareness raising. So doing policy on its own in our experience doesn't really work because you need to have kind of wider understanding from the public of the benefits of community ownership because the public need to really be behind the whole idea for policy to change. So a lot of our work is about kind of telling the stories of what our members are doing, kind of sharing all that really positive news. Two weeks ago, we ran our annual Community Land Week in Scotland, which is a joint project with the Scottish Government, where we have events happening across Scotland celebrating community ownership. And we also do quite a lot of cultural work. Again, it's really about telling those stories. So working with communities, we bring in artists to, to work with them and help tell their stories. And we also do work around kind of connection between land and culture. So we've recently had a project looking at the kind of connection between the Gaelic language and community ownership in Scotland. So for a small team, our work is pretty varied. Uh, next slide. I'm just gonna briefly talk about, about housing because I know as an audience, that's probably what you're most interested in. So as I said, it is, a, it is a common thing for communities to own, a common thing for communities to want to develop. We ran a survey a few years ago of our membership and we had 52 responses and of those 50, the organizations wanted to develop housing. A lot of our members in rural areas are trying primarily to stem depopulation and to make it easier for young people particularly to stay in those areas. We've got very high levels of holiday homes and second homes in rural Scotland. And that pushes the prices of housing up and can become unaffordable for young people. So the problem in rural areas is not jobs and it's not that young people don't want to stay there, it's that they can't afford to stay in those places. So that's where our members come in, often developing kind of small numbers of units of housing 
to allow people to stay in their community. And as David was saying, it's often not attractive for other types of house developers to be operating in those places where the population is quite small. But for many of those small communities, you know, having maybe two or three extra houses can help them keep the local school open. So it's really fundamentally important. In Scotland at the moment, the focus has been really on rural communities, and we would still see that as being extremely important. But there's no mechanism at the moment for communities in urban areas to be able to access funding for housing. You can do it if you're a small small town, but larger towns or cities, there's not really anywhere for them to go if they want to develop housing. And it is a bit of a strange thing in Scotland because um, urban housing, community-led housing is so common elsewhere. But here, it's just the missing part of the jigsaw here. We don't have very much of it. David talked about mid steeple quarter, which is probably the only real example in a large town or city anywhere in Scotland. So six months ago, we published a report calling for more support for urban community-led housing. The Scottish Government had also committed prior to that to piloting urban community-led housing in Scotland. So we're really keen to see more of that in the future. We think there's a real need for it. Next slide. So I'm just going to run you through some of the many assets that our members own. So the way that things work in Scotland is that a community, it might react to something coming up for sale or it might identify there's an asset they want to own and something they feel their community really needs. And then the, there are a number of different ways they can try and acquire that asset. It's not always straightforward, um, but it does mean our membership owns a huge range of different assets from whole islands to harbours, nature reserves. We even have one community that is developing a spaceport on their land at the moment. So you can see why it's such a kind of complex area and why communities might need access to that kind of technical support. But it's never boring. There's always a kind of new inquiry coming into community land Scotland from a community wanting to buy a different type of asset. Next slide. I'm going to talk briefly about kind of what's happening in urban areas in Scotland. So um, in 2003 in Scotland, the Scottish Government introduced community rights for communities that wanted to buy land and buildings, whether they were owned by the private or public sector. There was also a funding stream called the Scottish Land Fund, which is still exists and is a really important part of the picture in Scotland. That was only open to rural areas or areas where the population was less than 10,000 up until 2016. I think there was a kind of general feeling that that wasn't entirely fair. I mean, the whole movement had come from the rural sector and been driven by rural communities, but I think there was an increasing need to extend that out to towns and cities, and that happened in 2016. There'd always been some element of urban community ownership, but it was very low compared to rural. In 2017, the Scottish Government asked us to see why there wasn't much happening, given that they'd extended the rights and funding to communities the previous year. And we found that there was a whole range of different barriers for urban communities that might not exist in rural areas, which where community ownership is pretty well established. And um, they range everything from kind of a fast moving land market. It's much more difficult in some places to find out who owns land or buildings in urban areas. Kind of geographic model in Scotland it could be applied to urban areas, but maybe not in quite the same way as was happening in rural areas. There's a lack of capacity building had gone on, so in the Highlands and Islands particularly, um, through the local enterprise agency, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, that provided a lot of support to communities to build capacity. So those communities had the kind of strength and knowledge to be able to take assets on. That wasn't the case in urban areas. So we identified lots of problems and, you know, we can't just kind of sit back and say we're just going to let communities try and sort them out on their own. So... About 18 months ago, we launched a project called the Community Ownership Hub in Glasgow and Clyde Valley. Decided to take a regional approach to try and tackling some of these urban issues. So we've got two staff working in that hub. And one person, Carey, whose job is to develop policy and also build partnerships. So kind of trying to kind of tackle in a much more hands-on way some of those challenging policy areas. To commission research where there wasn't enough data available to help us understand what the problems were. And then we also have another member of staff, Heather, who works hands-on with communities. And the run up to setting up the hub, there's a, a lot of people thought there would be no need to have something like this in an urban area, that we would get no one contacting us for support. We estimated we'd get 10 communities contacting us in year one, and we had over 60. So there was definitely a kind of unmet need there. We also found that of the communities that contacted us, two thirds of them deprived areas. So it's been a really interesting project. We're about halfway through the project at the moment and it's already starting to produce some really interesting research results. Next slide. 
please. I'm just going to finish on some of our current policy work at the moment. So the way that we work in terms of policy is that we that our kind of frontline staff are working with communities. So they would see what some of the issues were. They're the ones picking up the telephone or answering the emails. Uh, and from that, we, could, we build an evidence base of where we think the sticking points are in terms of policy. Sometimes we'll commission small amounts of um, small pockets of research to try and help us kind of build up that evidence base. And we always try and take quite a constructive approach because we just find we're in quite a supportive policy environment in Scotland where we feel like you know, policymakers are quite open to listening to ideas. So we don't, we're not out there kind of campaigning with placards and things. It's much more useful for us to be able to kind of come forward with practical ideas and say, well, you know, the system is not working quite well enough. And like, here's some ideas about how it could be improved or there's a gap here and that's how that gap could be filled. So we're very fortunate in that respect that we're able to, to work in that way. So a few things we have going on at the moment. David mentioned public interest tests. We produced a short paper on that. just came out last week. And that public interest tests are when land sales happen. Scotland's got quite an unregulated land market at the moment. And land prices are going up very quickly because there's a lot of people buying land in Scotland to be able to access carbon credits in the future. And um, so we're looking at ways, and I say we, I would say the whole kind of land reform environment is looking at ways to try and manage that a bit better. And uh, community right to buy mentions the main route for communities to buy land through a legislative process. It's been really important in lots of ways and kind of changing the whole discussion around communities access to land and buildings. Now, most of those kind of, most of the time when communities are buying assets, it's done through negotiation. So it's a kind of positive relationship that like owners are willing to sell, communities you know, getting ready to buy. But the community right to buy exists. It's more kind of, to kind of a stronger system in a way that, and that it gives communities rights and um, to go through kind of certain processes. So some communities will decide to go down this route, but we've just been doing some research looking at this because our sense from talking to communities was that what started out as like a really fantastic system and has kind of changed the whole discussion was not working as well in kind of practical terms as it used to. So we're, we're looking to see like, why is that the case? And what, what could we suggest that might improve that situation? As I mentioned, we're looking for more support for urban community-led housing. We have an issue around ownerless land in Scotland as well. So there are, the Scottish Land Commission has also been working on this. Ownerless land and housing sense can often happen when housing company sets up a new company to build houses and then it kind of closes down the company at the end. And it can sometimes leave land with where nobody owns it. So we've been working on trying to kind of make an easier system for communities that want to take ownership of that land. So it's not just kind of sitting there, not doing anything. Also looking at vacant and derelict land through our urban work. And then also things like pre-notification of sales, because increasingly in Scotland, um, land is sold without everyone kind of going on the open market. So there's no chance for community to try and kind of get in there and buy things. That is just a kind of flavour of some of the and policy areas we're working on, but it's a really busy time in Scotland at the moment with the land reform bill open for consultation. So that's my kind of quick overview of uh, community land ownership in Scotland. I'll be happy to take some questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. That was an excellent quick overview of a lot of content there. So thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we know telling the stories of your members across the country certainly keeps community land Scotland busy. And as we can see there, that housing is just one part of the community ownership movement happening here. So we are going to look forward to following all of that research very closely and hopefully can get some more discussion in the question and answers. So I see a couple of people in the audience have hands up, so I will invite you to please send any questions into the Q&A section or the chat if you have that accessible, but focus all the, the panelists' questions in the Q&A, please. And next up, our last but certainly not least presenter, we have Nick Walker from Wigton and Gladnock Community Initiative. And this project is very near and dear to Sasha's heart. We're really proud to have helped support uh, the community-led homes in Wigton. And Dr. Nick Walker is a retired psychiatrist active in his local community. He was part of setting up Wigton and Gladnock Community Initiative, a community company whose mission is to bring neglected land and property into community ownership in a sustainable way. 
to benefit and enhance the lives of the people living in and visiting Wigton and Gladnock. He has just finished his term as board convener for the initiative. He has also been on Wigton Community Council and is a trustee of a local charity, the Wigton Festival Company, which puts on an annual book festival in Scotland's National Book Town. So thank you very much, Nick. Over to you for the presentation. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Thank you for asking me to be involved in this in this webinar. And thank you, Reese, for managing the slides. I think my, my talk kind of follows on reasonably well from, from David's and Lindsay's, partly, I suppose, because, because I'm going to talk about the community right to buy and, and because the initiative is one of the membership, one of the member organisations that Lindsay was referring to. Could I get the next slide, Reese, please? So I'm, go I'm going to say a little bit about, about Wigton and then a little bit about what set up our organisation and, and then a bit about using the community right to buy and what we're, what we're doing and how that links into housing. Wigton is, is a, a small, very old town in southwest Scotland, population about 900. It's a former royal borough from the 13th century and the former county town for the, the locality. It's been through a phase of, of industry shutting down and became quite neglected and deprived, but became Scotland's National Book Town 25 years ago. And that, that certainly helped to regenerate it economically to an extent. Because it was an important place in the past and because it's now bypassed by road and rail, there are a lot of old buildings and it's got a, a, a rich conservation area with a lot of heritage buildings and so forth. But there's limited work it tends to be lower paid and there are a lot of holiday houses and as as david and lindsay both referenced for local people in relatively low paid employment finding housing that they can afford is difficult and people retiring from the surrounding rural area who want to want to be in the town as they retire and maybe need something accessible or or able to get more help in as they as they become frailer find that difficult too Annabelle's colleagues at the South of Scotland Community Housing helped us with a, a housing needs assessment that identified in particular affordable and accessible housing as, as the, the big missing things in our community. And that, that was part of what led us to thinking about establishing the initiative. Next slide, Reese, please. So the the field in the middle of the houses that you can see in the in the in that image, which hopefully is, is visible for you on your screens, whatever size screens you've got, is the old show field. This is a parkland area in the, in the, in the middle of, of Wigton, physically central to the town, considered community land by the community, although it's not in reality community land, and central also to the, the lived experience of the community. It was, for over 150 years, the site of the agricultural show each year, and people who who were brought up in the town remember every summer going down to to the show to all the the exciting presentations and competitions and events and stalls and things that were there and the, the town being alive with that that show over the over the area the land now belongs to a developer however with frequent talk about building houses on it prior to the global financial crisis in 2008 permission to build houses had just been granted, but they never happened. And in 2016, we, a group of us in the community thought, since it's derelict, unused, undeveloped, the owners were not really engaging with the community in any way, we thought the community right to buy might be a, a good way of trying to get the land into community ownership to do things with. And we began to think about what things that might be. That stimulated setting up the, the initiative, and I'll say a little bit more about the right to buy process and, and what happened to the show field in due course. Could I get the next slide, please? So the, the developers who own the show field have not yet opted to put the field on the market. So, but in the meantime, the Bank of Scotland in Wigton closed in 2017. And we, in the initiative, saw this as an opportunity to do something that was very central to the town. 
the, the bank was a loss in as much as it was the only bank in the area, but also it, it was a large old building, a heritage building, a listed building in the middle of the conservation area right on the town square that had been poorly maintained and was quite dilapidated and needed a lot spent on sorting it out from the roof down. And there was a concern in the town that at the time when the market was, uh, was not functioning very well, that it might just become more and more dilapidated and be bad for the image of the town, bad for tourism, which is the main business for the area nowadays. And we, so we decided to pursue the community right to buy in order to get the chance to buy the building. We'd been unable, again, to engage with the owners. You'd think that we could find a bank of Scotland somewhere, but of course that they employ a company, they contract a company to manage their, their property, and the company that manages their property is in another part of the world. And I, I'm not sure they even quite knew where we were, let alone uh, wished to, to discuss things with us. So next slide, please, Rhys. The community right to buy process is, is, as Lindsay said, requires a place-based organisation in some form. So the initiative was set up for that purpose in that way. It's, it's defined by a geographical area and anyone who lives in the area is entitled to be a member of the organisation. Members of the organisation can stand for the board, can attend general meetings and, and elect the bulk of the directors on the, on the board. So most people running the organisation belong in the community. And there's an asset lock in, a, in some sense. So if property is, is bought by the organization or, uh, the, and the, it can't be then passed on to private ownership, for example, in order to prevent public funding being put into things that then get diverted into private, private hands. Uh, to get the right to buy notification, you have to have a property, obviously. You need to have proposals for its use and there must be support from the community and it must benefit the community. So we needed a petition demonstrating at least 10% of our community was in support of the, the application to get the right to buy. We had to have an outline proposal for what we would do with, with the property and we needed to demonstrate that there was a connection to the community from the property. That, that can be different things in different ways. For the show field, the connection was the historical use of, of the land for the show and for the, for the bank, it was about it being the bank that was one of the businesses in the community that was at heart of the community and it was physically in the middle of the community. The application then goes to the Scottish Government for approval. The staff in the Scottish Government Department who deal with it were very helpful in giving advice. We had, we had good advice and support from Lindsay Chum and from some of her other member organizations in the area who'd been through similar things. And that was, that was very helpful for getting the community to understand that actually you can do this stuff. Because communities often become quite, quite passive, feeling that you know, the, the market, the council, the government does things and, they, and, and we wait for it to happen. And this, it was unusual, I think, for, for small rural places to start to think about taking more responsibility and doing things themselves. Less so in the Highlands and Islands, where there's been a lot of work on uh, developing capacity. But in, in remote and rural mainland Scotland, it, it was a relatively new idea. So we were welcome, we welcomed that support. You're encouraged to engage with landowners, which, as I've said, was difficult. But landowners get the chance to respond to the application. And then once it's approved, if it's approved, your note of community interest lasts five years and entitles the organisation to effectively first refusal if the property goes on the market. Next slide, please, Rhys. Uh, so the next phase, when the property does go on the market, which hasn't yet happened for the show field, uh, which now has planning permission for 43 houses, most of them quite large and expensive but no action taken on doing anything about that. Uh, but for the Bank of Scotland building, it did go on the market. We then had to decide, did we wish to activate the right to buy? And if we, if we were able to do so, that would give us up to eight months to complete planning, funding, and negotiating the actual purchase. We opted to do that. In order to activate the right to buy though, you need a full business plan. You need to, so we'd spent some time developing that, 
in between getting the right to buy notification and, uh, and the property coming on the market. And there was consultation with the community about what can we do with the building, what would we do, what should we do, what might be useful, what's needed in the town. Uh, not wanting to replicate other things, but wanting to provide stuff that was necessary for the town. And the housing needs assessment was an important part of that. You need the business plan really to justify getting funding as well for these processes. The sale price is set by an independent valuer who's appointed by the government. Community support needs to be demonstrated and the, the Scottish government instructed an independent organisation to do a, a community referendum. Um, which has to demonstrate significant support. They, they say at least 50% of people in the community should vote, and of those who vote, at least 50% should be in favour. But there's, there's discretion around that, so a, a lower turnout but a much higher level of support is acceptable. And then, if all of that's approved and the right to buy is activated, you rush to get your funding sorted out and purchase the place and, and get on with the work, which actually sounds quite easy but is quite difficult. Next slide please. And, and of course once you've got the building that's when the work really begins. We, we had our pictures in the paper and we drummed up business and asked people if we could bank on their support for, uh, for buying the building and of course we managed to do that. Next slide please. And what did we do with it when we owned the Bank of Scotland building? We, uh, the, there were several suggestions came out of the community consultation, but on balance, the ones that were practicable, deliverable, desirable, preferred, and affordable and achievable were these. Affordable housing, uh, one large three-bedroom flat, and one small one-bedroom accessible flat. Uh, and these, these were, are affordable. It's a condition of a couple of the grants we got that they have to be truly affordable, and that means uh, that the, the rent is tied in perpetuity to benefit payment level rent uh, requirements. Um, and we have let both of those tenancies. There's a, a young woman and her family living in the, in the three bedroom flat who moved from unsatisfactory, overcrowded, damp housing where she'd been for a year or so. Um, she worked in one of the shops locally and everybody knew her and it's been it's been a, a, a truly remarkable experience to, to see how she and her family have flourished and how appreciative they are. And uh, that's been a, a really positive thing for the community to recognize that we could deliver something like that. And to think, you know, it is possible to do stuff and not to rely on others to do it. Um, the other parts of the, of the property, though, there's a, a small booktown bunkhouse in the old retail space at the front of the bank which is a, a three ensuite rooms with for two people each and a, a kitchen and sitting area as a small affordable hotel in effect to add to what is a, a fairly poor level of provision of holiday accommodation in the area and there's a big garden at the back which is has just been cleared out last weekend actually and will provide some allotments and community garden space for for the community next slide please Rhys. There are, of course, some ups and downs, which I'll just reference quickly. The, the downs first, building capacity in, in terms of numbers of people, the time they have available and the skills they have in the community as a whole and in the organization is a, a challenge, but support from various agencies has been very helpful for that. Establishing relationships with landowners was difficult, and, but, but need not be so. I think that, that depends very much on case by case. Getting plans organized, consulting, involving people enough is, is complicated and needs a lot of support and a lot of effort. And COVID, of course, interfered with that, as it did with the renovation of the building, which was two years delayed, but fortunately came in just within budget. And gathering funding in the relevant time is timescales is difficult. And of course, there are always a few people who think that's a bad idea, but they were a few people. Um, and the next bit of that slide, please, Reese. Uh, we have an active community, though, with some very competent folk who are very interested and very involved. We have great support from South of Scotland Community Housing, from Community Land Scotland, from uh, other communities and near and far, really, who've done similar things. And 
I'm very grateful to the support from other people on the board and for the community itself. And for the housing aspects, the local authority, the Dumfries and Galloway Council was really helpful too. And there were several streams of funding. If you, I'm going to run over time, but if you move to the next slide, please. There's a, a quick list of funders, the Scottish Land Fund, as you mentioned, was the bulk of the purchase price that we had some to And for planning, the Scottish Land Fund and the Rural Housing Fund both, both provided stage one grants to allow us to develop uh, the things we needed to in order to decide to proceed. Uh, for the renovation work, the housing aspects were predominantly Rural Housing Fund, but also Town Centre Capital Fund and Town Centre Living Fund, one from the Scottish Government and one from the, from the local authority. And for the non-housing bits, we had some development money from Scottish and Southern Electric, uh, from the Architectural Heritage Fund, and from Kilgallia Community Benefit Fund, which is a, a, a fund locally from Wind Farm uh, money. And uh, the last slide just shows a lovely picture looking across from the top of Wigton, looking across the bay. Uh, to, to encourage you all to visit Wigton at some point when you're, when you're on your holidays in Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Nick. I know it is never an easy process, but WBCI certainly makes it look as easy as possible. So thanks for sharing that inspiring example with us. And this is what all of our policy and advocacy conversations are about, is making that process easier and getting more delivered projects, just like WBCI's on the ground for people in the community. Thank you for that. I'll now invite all of our speakers to please join us back in a group panel for Q&A and encourage the audience to get all of your questions typed in into our Q&A, if you haven't already, please. First question that we have here from Charlotte. Have any communities had success using the relatively recently enacted community right to buy for sustainable development? And I'll add, and why not? So maybe if you could start us off with that, Lindsay, please. Not yet, I'm gonna say. My understanding is there are some communities in the early stages of going through that process. It's quite a high bar for communities. All the community rights to buy are quite complicated and because the way that the law works is trying to balance the human rights of communities with the property rights of landowners, because the sustainable development community right to buy is effectively compulsory purchase, the bar is higher um, than the previous, than the community right to buy that Nick, Nick's organisation used. So it's not a, it's not something that you would just get to get up in the morning and I'm going to take that off today, I'll just put in a community right to buy. <laughs> it is quite a complicated process, which is probably why there's not been more communities going going through it yet but our understanding is the Scottish Government at some point is going to review all of the rights to buy and try and get a bit more information about why some of them aren't progressing but the sustainable development I think it's probably too early to, to say why it's why or whether it needs to change or not. Thank you. David or Nick would you like to add any thoughts on the difficulty of that process? No not yet thank you. Okay, so second question we have. To what extent are community-owned projects reliant on Scottish government subsidies in financing? And what incentives can be built in for small investors? Who would like to start answering that one on the panel? Why do I start with that one? So if you look at kind of public subsidy into, into communities, the, the main one's the Scottish Land Fund, and that's that's the kind of capital funding at the beginning. So that provides usually most of the cost of purchase. But having been in an organisation that's had a Scottish Land Fund award, you get this beautiful moment where money appears in your account, and then a couple of hours later it disappears again. So the money comes into communities to buy the asset, and then it goes up, obviously goes on to the person you're purchasing it from. And then the majority of communities after that are not getting kind of significant amounts of, amounts of public subsidy unless they're doing some kind of project such as developing housing in a, in a challenging area, something that would not, that where there's market failure happening, then you might be looking at public subsidy to come in to make the books balance. If you're a community landowner, you, you can't take equity investment apart from through a very specific type of investment called community shares. So at the moment, if you're a community, landowner you're completely wholly owned by your 
I mean, I, I'm probably not the best person to comment on investment more generally into other types of development that wouldn't be community owned. So I will let someone else answer that question. I, I can chip in a little bit, I suppose. I, I'm not sure that I can answer that, but either Lindsay, but we, we, we obviously got Scottish Land Fund for the capital purchase. And I, and I think quite a lot of right to buy stuff is rooted through that way, whether with the community right to buy or, or by negotiation. And, it, and the Scottish government's been very keen to continue to top that fund up. How long that goes for in the current economic climate is a different question. We, because there was an emphasis on, on rural depopulation or repopulation and, and getting younger people to stay in, in areas where they can work locally and so forth, we were quite luckily placed and well supported by Annabelle's colleagues to, uh, to get the Town Centre Living Fund and Town Centre Capital Fund money, which made a big difference, and the Rural Housing Fund money for the housing aspects of what we do. But our, our aim was for the rents and the, and the income from the bunkhouse to be coming back into the organisation to be beginning to build up a bit of, of a head of steam to try and make a business model that's a bit more sustainable so that we can find other ways of, of making money and doing things to continue the sort of project and to look at the next thing of, of developing some more housing and or developing some other community assets in the, in the broader area. Next question we have here, we'll, we'll direct this to you to start. David said that land could be transferred to a local constituted community body. How is such a body formed and structured? And once land is acquired by such a body, does it own it forever and lease it out? In Nick's words, is there an asset lock or is the land sometimes resold? Thanks. I, I suspect Lindsay and Nick might know as much or more about this than me, but um, I mean, uh, we're talking about community land trusts today, but you can have different different sorts of constitutions. But in, in general, if, if you were buying land and certainly if you're getting funding from government, there'll be conditions anyway as to what you can do with the land. So you know, in, in most cases, it will remain in ownership. And in fact, even one of the, the projects I showed a picture of in staff in the Nile of Sky, while there was housing for, for sale developed by the community's housing trust there, it's for below market value. And there's still a, a built-in mechanism that ensures that that, you know, that investment or the fact that it is not for market has continued and, and subsequent sales so i um, mean lindsay and nick might have more to say on this but i think usually there is protection to to ensure that you know it continues to benefit the community and be affordable Would you like to come to add? Shall, I, shall i chip in next lindsay about our example and then you, you can perhaps generalize it a wee bit from your broader your broader experience and the wigton and bladner community community initiative is a is a company limited by guarantee which is a is a company model, but it's one that doesn't have shares. So the the members, the people who live in the community who who opt to join are the shareholders, if you like, but they commit a pound at the most, and they only have to do that if if it all goes to hell in a handcart. Um, so so it's a it's a company structure and therefore a legal entity in itself, which owns the owns the the assets. And that allows it to be more sustainable rather than, you know, for example, I've, I've stepped back from the board recently because I'm about to be moving away from the community, but there are others who are involved who, who take that on. The, the Scottish Land Fund were, would, would have allowed us to, for example, sell a little bit of the garden area and keep the money to put into the pot to, to put towards the project more generally, but they wouldn't allow us to sell a significant portion of, of the land. The Rural Housing Fund grant, which was, which was mainly what paid for the conversion for the flats, um, came with a condition that if we sold anything, we had to pay the money back. So, and that's something that you know, we could have looked to borrow money elsewhere and to, to do it differently, but, but the thought of that scared us an awful lot. And we thought, what? You know, our, our whole ethos was about 
providing affordable housing for people in the community to to cover a bit of a gap in the market. So having those those conditions built in, I think you know if it's public money from taxpayers that's being spent on these things, I think it, it's right that it needs to be locked in some way. And um, I just added a few panel comments on that. So certainly any any investment from the Scottish Land Fund, they would be, they expect you to be asset locked and to have a requirement that at least 50% of your members are from the local area, so it's community controlled. So I suppose that when money goes into a community, there's no private individual getting the benefit from that. So it's the whole community that owns the asset and the whole community gets the benefit. And sometimes that can be things like just rejuvenation of the community, and depopulation so it's not as if that kind of wealth is being extracted out to individuals it's all kind of locked usually within the community and there's always a requirement that if the organization would fold then it gets passed on to another similar organization it's probably worth saying as well that it's like community ownership is an incredibly stable model and that the scottish government which is figures every year in the number of communities that own assets and i can't remember exactly the figure now it just came out a couple of weeks ago but something like 460 communities in scotland that own assets and to our knowledge only one community has ever gone through that process and then had to close down it's an incredibly stable model if you're going through community right to buy as nicola have experienced the bar is a bit higher in terms of what you need to do as a community you need to have at least 75 percent members need to be from your community and there are some other requirements which are all specified in the legislation so there's kind of different options depending on what kind of rights and funding you're looking for. Thank you very much and um, we are just after five now so I'm just going to bring one more question in and um, if that's all right for those of you that do need to go we certainly understand but one more question to the panel and um, before I, I wrap up if everyone will allow me. All of the speakers seem to recognize the issues clearly, yet the problem seems to revert to land ownership and second home ownership, which effectively supports larger developers and landowners. Can dealing with this core problem really be dealt with in time to affect true community benefit more readily and speedily? I might start with Lindsay, if that's all right, on this one. The question yeah, is, yes. yes. I mean, certainly the communities on their own cannot solve this problem. You know, one of our members was saying that you know, they were kind of working away building houses and houses were disappearing out of kind of residential use to become second homes faster than they could build houses. So as I would say it's one part of a wider model, but we've, we've certainly done work as well looking at, you know, how kind of second home ownership and holiday homes can be controlled more so as something you, you have to kind of look across the range of policy measures. I mean, there are benefits to communities in owning their own housing that are not just about um, creating affordable housing and there's lots of other kind of benefits as well. But I think, yes, without kind of looking at addressing the problems of second homes and holiday homes, it's hard for communities to solve all these problems on their own. Thank you very much yep, for that great answer. Anything to add, Nick or David? Okay. I, I think it's it's a, it's other bits of government policy that are needed to try and address that ar around requirements, restrictions, regulation of, of land ownership, for example, but requirements to reside for certain periods of time. But but there are there are relatively recently introduced tax disincentives for uh, for second home ownership, and the local tax council tax rates systems are changing a bit for second and multiple homes that that begin to penalise people a little bit. Um, it's obviously not not going to touch the people who've got pots and pots of money, but it, it maybe starts to get the focus a little bit. And there is there is legislation now that enables local authorities to restrict the number of Airbnbs in in areas to try to discourage second homes being used for holiday houses too. But yeah, I think I think it's it's not just communities that need to take a part in trying to manage that aspect of it. Yeah, just briefly agree with others. I mean, it's a complex issue and I think you can partly solve it by supply and enabling communities to have access to land. And I also, we found in our research that there's a case for public interest led development. Part of the reason developers, you know, build high value homes in high value areas as they're looking to 
to manage risk and make profit. So I think there's a case for public bodies to do more to bring forward land for development and support communities. But yeah, the, there's other issues around taxation and, and planning. I, I, I think you certainly can solve it just by doing more new build community housing on its own. Thank you very much to all of our presenters and our, our speakers on this panel. For more information about Community Land Scotland, Scottish Land Commission, or Wixing and Bladnock Community Initiative, please check out their websites and follow all of the research and interesting discussions, consultations, and projects that you've heard a bit about today. And I would like to thank the Centre for CLT Innovation for jointly hosting this webinar today. Thank you to all of our partners and sponsors for the International Community Land Trust Festival. And most importantly, thanks to everyone who joined today and for your interest and your engagement and coming along to the session. We do hope to see you again soon.